So what's going on, family? How y'all doing? What's going on? What's going on? I'm going to wait till a few of you guys get up in here. How y'all doing? Good Sunday. Happy Sunday, y'all. Happy Sunday. What's going on, family? How y'all doing? What's up, family? How y'all doing? What's going on? I'll wait till a few more of you guys get up, man. We're going to talk today. We're going to be talking about um, money and credit. From a national standpoint, we're not talking about just business in general. We're really going to be talking about, you know, the business side from being a national, you know. How y'all doing, family? What's going on? Give it like 30 more seconds, y'all. We're going to get right to it. 30 more seconds. Like at what, 140? Yeah, 140 or something like that. What's good, family? Chino, how y'all doing? Joey Lay, how y'all doing? What's going on? Y'all ready? Yeah, I'm all good. It's been a good day. Can't complain. It's been a real good day. All right, 10 more seconds, y'all, 10 more seconds. I just want a few people to hear this. What's going on, family? What's up, what's up? All right, okay, now look. So pretty much we're going to be talking about money and we're going to be talking about credit a little bit, mainly the money side as far as like business and everything like that because, you know, I got a lot of people who are trying to switch over but their job is, is, is hindering them, right? So say, if, say for instance, say the average person, they, they got to work a nine to five, right? But of course, you know, people got to pay their you know, phone bill. They got to take care of their family. They got to do the whole nine yards. So, you know, as a national, a lot of people get that complicated because I'm going to tell y'all something, right? Even though I got the passport book and the passport card, it's a lot of places, right, that, even, that wouldn't even accept your employment just with a passport card. And I'm going to tell y'all why. Because it doesn't specify y'all exact address. And also, that's not evidence of uh, being a, what would I want to say, a resident of the state. So most of the time, when you go apply for a job, they always want you to have a state ID. And I know that's kind of strange for the most part. But yeah, you know, it's, it's hard when you're dealing with that aspect of things. And just so... You know, living as a national and you want to like have a business and everything like that. A lot of people just ask me a lot of questions. Man, should I start the business like this? Should I start the business like that? Now, depending on what type of business you're trying to get into, because it just depends on what you're really trying to do. So when I, you know, when I create my little tutorials and everything like that, it's mainly to show people an avenue. Because remember this, right? So I sell a tutorial that pretty much teaches people how to sell on Amazon. Now, I had a, a troll was like, oh, are you just selling courses? No, 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 listen, listen here. When you learn how to sell on Amazon, it's not just, oh, you just uh, buy a 30 second course and you learn, no, no. It's a lot to selling on Amazon. And I'm gonna tell y'all why. Because number one, you gotta know what Amazon FBA is. You have to know how to make a proper listing on Amazon. You gotta know how to snipe items. You know, um, you gotta know the whole ramification of it. And so, Pretty much when I teach people about how to sell on Amazon, I'm not teaching you how to sell on Amazon from a perspective of like, you know, just, hey, you can you can make millions. I tell you what I sell. You know, that's a different story. When a person tell you what they sell and they show you their suppliers who they actually dealing with and they show the product that they selling, if my product don't sell, I don't eat. So if I show you exactly what I sell, that's when people be like, oh, wow, wow. You know, so, and, and, and I made like a, what, a two hour, two and a half hour tutorial, and, and it was in detail because it's a lot of explaining to do. If I had to literally hop on the phone with someone and talk to them about how to set up their Amazon account, they, they head probably explode because they'd be like, it's too much information to take in. So that's why I always, you know, create the tutorials where people can go back on and check them out just so they can get that edification, right? Now, selling online don't have to be your own avenue because there's many ways to make money. I just found my own niche when, when you're dealing with 
selling online. It's, it's real easy to sell online. It's not even hard. It's not complex or anything. You just got to know what to sell. And so when I put in my tutorial, I show you guys what I sell. Not know what you could sell, what you possibly could sell. That is included as well, but I actually show what I sell just so a person can have that structure. So say if a person, he wanted to let you sell on, on eBay. He just say, hey, this how you list on eBay? I'm out. And you're like, what am I going to sell? But if you say, hey, I buy this iPad from this supplier here, right here, and this, their name, then you would be like, oh, yeah, he for real because if he go through this supplier and this is his mainly supplier and his only source of supplier and he getting all his products from this supplier and he's selling the goods, if his supplier don't work, nine times out of ten, he ain't eating from it. And so anytime someone's selling you a course or anything like that, you want to make sure that like, hey, are you selling stuff on Amazon? Are you making money off Amazon? Are you doing this? Because if a person just say, hey, I'm selling you an Amazon course and they not sell, making sales on Amazon, that'd be crazy. That'd be insane because a lot of people ain't, you know, showing everybody like, okay, you got to, you got to, people got to, got, people got to have something to reference off of. So if people don't have nothing to reference off of, then nine times out of 10, they, they know you just selling them some bullshit, you know, but for the most part, you know, just being a national in itself, it, it requires a lot. It requires you to be independent. It requires you to have your own business. It requires you to, you know, to eliminate your job, but it also requires you to, uh, you know, replace your income, right? So as many things you can do, you can get a lawn care service. You can, a lot of one thing that's really hot is disputing people credit, right? That's one thing that's hot. And also, y'all, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm finally, I'm finally getting the, um, the office. Remember I was telling y'all about the office that I was going to set up. So I'm setting that up uh, Tuesday because tomorrow Memorial's Day and everything. So Tuesday, I'll be going into the office. I'm going to check it out. It's right next to the airport. And um, they, want, they want a lot of money. They want like $900 a month. But it's worth it because I'm going to be reporting credit to all three credit bureaus. And I'm going to show you guys that course as well. I do have that course already, but I'm going to show y'all from the office standpoint. I'm actually going to show y'all the live me sending it out to the credit bureaus aspect of it. Because once y'all see that, y'all gonna be like, dang. You can report credit, yeah. You know, like it's, it's many ways to make money, but you just gotta come. You gotta, you have to hear from the horse's mouth. You know, you can't just hear from anybody who's just talking. If I didn't make money off anything that I talked about, then I would be a liar. So if a person bring up something like, man, have you ever made money off Amazon? Yes, I made money off Amazon. What's the most money you ever made off Amazon? I made twelve thousand five hundred in five days. What did you sell on Amazon? I'm like ID printing machines. Who is your supplier? And I can show them the supplier. How much did you pay for? I can show them how much I paid for it. How much you sold for eighteen hundred and sixty-five dollars? How many units you sold? I sold nine. How many? How fast you sold the units? I'm like, okay, it took a month and a half. Once the uh, once I relist the listing, so all this stuff, you know, people got to bring receipts. If a person gonna sell y'all anything, if they come come to y'all like, hey, I got this plan, you got to make sure that they are that they are benefiting from what they telling teaching you, and and they also got uh, references. And stuff like that that they can go off of to show everybody like, look this is what i do this is how much money i make then people are like okay yeah you the truth you got it i have no problem paying for the course i just want to know is this from a reliable source is this from someone who actually selling on that platform and actually making something happen you feel me so a lot of things you can do if y'all handy you know like good handyman you know you can have like you know get you um a mechanic shop or something like that or you could be an independent mechanic. One thing that I noticed, like when people dealing with trades, one trade that's really in high demand, if you a mechanic, and that's like swapping engines. If you can swap a transmission, swap an engine and stuff like that, those uh, requires like intense skills and, and intense work. Like you just couldn't be like a normal mechanic who just replace brakes and everything like that. But if you swap engines, transmissions, you will have money for the rest of your life. You know, so it just like it, it forces you to be independent. It forces you because like you don't want to contract with the state. You don't want to work for the government. You don't want taxes to be taken out your check. You don't want to do any of that. And also, I'm going to tell you all some honestly, you will never have to pay taxes being independent because you never have to report your income. So me, I probably make a lot of money, but I never have to report it. So if I do a consultation or if I sell something, now only time I do have to pay taxes is when I sell um, something on Amazon, but this is the key part. When I sell something to Amazon, this is what corporations do. Every time something is sold, they charge the customer taxes. 
And the only thing I'm doing is uh, filing for those taxes that the customer paid at the end of the year on my corporation. That's what people do all the time. So the, 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 the actual tax get transferred over to the customer. In actuality, the tax uh, bill was supposed to get transferred over to the corporations. But they transfer that to the consumer. So the consumer is actually paying the taxes for the corporation. So anytime you go into like a store, right? Say if you go inside of Starbucks. Now Starbucks say um, the drink is $1, but plus taxes is $1.11, right? So 11 cent is what they can is what they can claim on their taxes for a refund. So all you did was pay the IRS and and all the IRS did was paid the corporations back in a, in a, in, a, in a, you know, and they return and everything like that. Yeah. Yep. You were right about that. Thank you, family. I appreciate that. But yeah, for the most part, yeah. So, you know, all like, you know, transactions and everything like that, that stuff get transferred over to the customer instead of the corporation. And the corporation filed on their tax returns and get your whole amount back, you know? So it's a crazy game that we live in, you know, crazy world. And it, it, like I said, there's many ways to make money, right? Just, I'm a, I only can go off of what I do personally. I couldn't really go off of anything else. It's just throwing stuff out there. But realistically, you will have to be in a position like this. If you, if you got a business, right? If you want to start a business, you ask me, hey, what should I do, right? I'll always ask you, what's your budget? Like, what you dealing with? How much money you dealing with? Now, some people will come to me, they're like, man, I got $300 to my name. Uh, you're in survival mode. If you got $300 to your name and under $1,000, you're in survival mode. So you couldn't just sell a product on Amazon and just sit back and drink coconuts. You will literally have to go get a lawnmower and cut your whole street down just to build up the type of income in order to start yourself right. I had some people come to me and they said, man, I got $10,000. And I said, $10,000, now you have way more leverage. So with $10,000, you can buy you at least about five ID printing machines. So that'd be 5,000 and you could make 9,300 off of it. And if you make 9,300, you might walk away, you know, with 4,000 4, or something like that. And that's good. So if you do that and you walk away with 4,000, and you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you're going to make some, some good money every single month. But if you got under $1,000, you in survival mode. So you got to be clean. You can be, you know, cleaning out people's basements. You can be washing cars. You can do stuff like that. Because now you're in a position where you still have to grow your revenue. You still got to grow some of your income up in order to even make those investments. Because the machines that I buy, right? So that's how it works. I buy my machines. My machines are 700 and forty dollars. Now my um, my ink cartridges to it is forty. So I could pay forty for it, depending on how many I buy in bulk. And my PVC car is like twenty. So you add that up, I'm around like what, like let's say seven eighty plus shipping. I'm out of pocket about all together about nine hundred. And when I sell the product, I could sell it for eighteen hundred. So eighteen hundred, I'm walking away with like nine hundred or something. But they take out a fee. So I'm really walking away with like seven, six hundred. But but if you times that by ten, that's like seven thousand dollars off ten units in profit. So seven thousand every month, that's good money. Especially if you multiply it. So you can get so if you can afford to buy ten units every month, you will be like, okay, seven, I'm walking away with seven thousand every time. Seven thousand, seven thousand, seven thousand, seven thousand, seven thousand, seven thousand. And you you multiply it like that. You know, that's just how I calculate based on what I do. Now, someone else said if you, you did uh, lawn care, you could say if I get like over 100 contracts, you can add the, add the amount for the contracts up and you can get way more employment and you can just do it like that. You can start with a lawnmower. Look, so I got to prove, I'm going to tell you all this, right? Now, this is for the hard working side. Like, say if you a hard worker, you went into this tech stuff, right? I got to prove for uh, Home Depot uh, line of credit. It's called a... Um, but it's called an extra car, extra car or something like that. I got a commercial line of credit from Home Depot. They only approved two thousand, but I'm gonna tell y'all something, right? It's summertime. With two thousand dollars, right? I got approved for a line of credit. So I bought something the other day. They gave me like a discount. I bought like what's this? Some paint? What was something I bought, man? You know, candy or something. You know, just to just to you know see what it is. It gonna go through. It went through and everything, right? 
So they gave me two two thousand dollars in the line of credit. I could give me a leaf blower, a weed whacker, a lawnmower, and I can get the little spray, you know, to fertilize your grass. And I can get like a little, you know, little trailers that they have that you can put all your stuff on. Or if you don't get the trailer, if you got a truck, you just put it on the back of the truck. And you get all your lawn equipment. All that lawn equipment, I'll be out of, out of pocket, $1,500. But that's no money. That's, that's not a penny down. And, and buy me a whole lot of gas cans. And that's the lawn care service that, itself. And you can have your lawn care service running it up. You can have your team. You can buy you three, four lawnmowers. And then you get the couple weed whackers. They're about a hundred and some dollars. The lawnmower is about two hundred. You take three of your friends. You go all across your city and you get the contracts from here and now. And you're just doing work just like that. And it's just being on the independent skill set because that's a good way to start off. Like me, that's what I told my family. I'm like, yeah, we can. We can do a lawn care service too because you got it. If, if you ain't got it, you just like, ah, okay, I just can't be lazy. I just can't. I ain't, I ain't got that type of sit back money. Sit back money is when you. 20, 30,000 comfortably, and you can just throw 10,000 towards the idea. Yeah, that's sit back money. But if you don't got sit back money, you got to work harder. And there's nothing wrong with working harder because uh, honestly, it's no risk involved. So if you're a lawn care service and you're making two, three thousand dollars a day comfortably, then you you only using your labor. Otherwise, the person who's paying 10,000, he's putting up 10,000 every time he, he, he do his investment. Only thing you just bringing his labor. So, yep, just like that. What's up, family? What's going on? Yep. Yeah, you just you do it just like that, and that's how you write. You know, just just because you if you want to live in a private, if you don't want to uh, deal with the county municipal and all that stuff, you want to be in a private. You want to do you. You just have to make sure that you're 100% separate, separated. You're like, oh, I don't want to work these jobs. Let's do something else. Let's find something else. Trust me. And there's so much you can do. Y'all know, listen, you can go to the forest and chop wood and sell wood. Actually, it's another ways to make money. You can be a fisherman. It's like, it's so many ideas out there. And fisherman is free. My wife, father, she he went out to uh, the north part of the suburbs in Chicago and call 200 fish, you can take that to the market and sell it for like, you know, two, three hundred dollars. He would well, if he did that every day, that'd be a six figure job just like that, doing all something he loved. You know, you gotta look at all these probabilities, especially, and this is only dealing with people with lower income, people who don't have the investment capital. Cause you're gonna have to get your hands dirty now. Cause if you ain't got 10, 20,000 to play with, then you gotta get your hands dirty. And it's okay, cause either way it goes, you still will make it. Because all you got to do is just think of something strategic. All of you guys can go up there and get it. So, if, look, I'm going to say this. If you got a corporation or an LLC, um, and it's been over like two years you had it, even if you got decent credit, apply for it. When you go to um, when you go to Home Depot, apply for a commercial line of credit. It's a credit card, right, that they give you, right? So, when you get that credit card, um, they should approve you off the rip for $2,000. Just say you make over a hundred or some thousand, they're gonna approve you starting off with two thousand dollar limit. Now, if you were real, now if you know you your long care service is gonna go crazy, you can actually ask for a credit increase. So you can say, turn this two thousand to four or five thousand. Four or five thousand, make sure you get all your equipment. So if you get all your equipment, you'll be ready to you'll be good to go. So you ain't gotta be, oh man, I'm trying to, you know, you ain't gotta use your money. Like me, I don't gotta use my own money. So if I ever thought about, you know, getting a long care service. I don't gotta use my own money, you know? You can use their money. Use their credit. All you gotta do is buy all your, your equipment. You can buy your workers' clothes. You can buy all your lawnmowers, your everything, and, and get these contracts going. Y'all got any questions? Anybody got any questions? Yep, you do it just like that. Y'all could do it just like that. You can do it just like that. You can run it up. Um, if anybody want to reach out to me, my phone number is 224-463-1848.
Again, 224-463-1848. Nah, you don't got to go to New Mexico. Actually, if you got all your documents from your country, you can get a U.S. passport. But you won't be classified as an, uh, an American on your passport. It's going to say, you know, country you was born in. It's going to say Mexico. So you still can get a U.S. passport even though you're from Mexico. Build a personal credit and business credit. You, what you want to do with personal credit and business credit, you want to build the personal side. And then once you get the personal side together, it won't be nothing for you to get business credit. So say if you get a business checking line of credit, and once you actually get that, that's going to report on towards the business credit anyway. So when people build business credit, it's cool, but they, uh, they really qualify you for the business credit based off the personal. It's not like uh, how it was a long time ago where they look at corporations, strictly as corporations. Now they trying to intertwine the two and they trying to run the uh, the personal and the business, but they only really looking at the person. They only they don't, they don't even care about the business. The business can have zero credit, but if your personal credit you got mortgage on your credit, you got an auto loan on your credit, you got a um, what else I want to say a credit card that's over five years old, and you ain't got no inquiries, you are gonna get that instantly, easily. That's why it's very good to have a mortgage on your credit. You want to have a mortgage reporting on your credit. If you don't got a mortgage per reporting on your credit, you will see a lot of denials. That's one of the highest things you can put on your credit. And when I be talking about a mortgage, this, a mortgage can help you get any type of loan you want. So a mortgage can help you get all kinds of loans, like like business checking line of credit, personal loans, home equity line of credit. Um, what else I want to say? Um, what else? All types of loans, you know. Some of the hardest loans that it might be to get, you will be able to get it, especially with a mortgage on your loan. Because having a mortgage or, or that type of installment debt is what banks look for. Those are one of the key factors in credit and what every credit bureau looking for. I know someone who, who got two, three mortgages on their credit, five to seven auto loans, about 10, 15 credit cards, averaging around five years in history. They can get anything they want. They actually had a 90% approval rate with their credit. So they can get anything they want. Yeah. Cancel everything from the state. You want to cancel all contracts with the state. So, oh, I want to get to this, right? So y'all remember when I got pulled over, right? And I, and I want to, and I actually want to say this verbally so it won't just be a post, right? So I just put the, I just took, put the business and the credit to the side. So, when I got pulled over by the police, right? So that on that particular day, the officer, the reason why he was carrying us, had us there so long, right? I didn't realize until, you know, we finished up everything and all that, right? The reason why the officer kept, kept me there for an hour, right? It wasn't because I didn't have a license. It really just wasn't even because they were just trying to overstep. But they were trying to overstep, but this is what, the, this is what keep the officer like this is what kind of made him mad and when he was talking to me he was looking away right so he was being disgenuine un, like non-genuine right he was just looking away he was like this he like yeah so you have to go to court and he was looking like that and the reason why he was doing that right because I'm gonna let y'all see hold on give me one second I'm gonna show y'all for myself right this is what I gave, this is why I gave the officer with my passport. Let me just show y'all something real quick. Let me show y'all something. Uh, let me show y'all something, let me show y'all something. All right, now, let me show y'all something real quick. All right, y'all see this? Y'all see this right here? Hold on. So look, I'm gonna let y'all look at this, right? So look up, look at this. Look, restricted. Do not stop. Do not detain. Do not interrogate. Lifetime concealed weapons permit, right? If y'all don't know, if y'all don't understand what that means, what happened was he knew I had a gun in the car. That was an insinuation I had a gun in my car. But I'm gonna tell you what, I'm a convicted felon, quote unquote, right? He see that on the record. So this man cannot possibly have a concealed weapons permit if he's a convicted felon, quote unquote, right? So his idea was, I need to gain jurisdiction. 
So what he he constantly tried to pull me in in so many ways. That's why he wanted me to sign the bond over, right? So they wasn't able to bond the bond over, right? The citations were just a ticket, ain't nothing. But the bond was the eye bond he tried to get me. I didn't, I refused to sign it. But for the gun, he wanted me to give them the address so they can search the vehicle. Because that's what he would have did. If I would have been an idiot, ooh, I live on 1110 Street, he would have, he would have said, okay, he would have got that. He would have came back to the vehicle. He said, Mr. Williams, I'm going to have a quick question. Do you have any firearms in this vehicle? You know, just like the regular person, I might would have said no. Um, yeah, we need you to step out. Okay, we stepped out. He would have said, it says here on this paper, lifetime concealed weapons permit. Um, on your record, it said you were convicted felon, right? So, he, once I would have stepped out, he would have went inside, he would have seen it. He would like, you know, he would have seen it. But since I put that on my paper, he knew it was a gun in the car. But they didn't have jurisdiction to search the vehicle, right? And they didn't have RAM jurisdiction to take the vehicle. So RAM jurisdiction is pretty much when your car is registered with the county and the state. Therefore, they have, they have RAM jurisdiction. Now, if your car is not registered, they, they try to obtain personal jurisdiction in order to search the vehicle. Personal jurisdiction would be you admitting to an address. Admitting to an address gives them territorial jurisdiction, and which gives them personal jurisdiction because you agree that you reside within the federal territory. You actually can search this up. And so he was very disappointed to let that go. And that's why he wanted to make the arrest. It wasn't just because of, oh, he was driving with no license because it would just been a high and buy. But when I put life and concealed weapons permit, he knew it was a gun in the car. He knew it was a gun in the car. And like I said, um, you, uh, statutes, code, regulation doesn't apply to a person if they does not meet minimum contacts, which is required when you're dealing with the, the District of Columbia. This is the District of Columbia calling. You cannot make any call or claim against a person on any case without minimum contacts. Minimum contacts is when you have a connection with the state. They have to prove minimum contacts in order to search you. They have to prove minimum contacts in order to arrest you. They have to prove it. Because if minimum contacts is, isn't met, they cannot make an arrest. And that's how it works with jurisdiction. They need minimum contacts or a contractual waiver. A contractual waiver can get them uh, minimal contacts, and that's when you verbally say where you live or you say your social security number. Now you verbally express a contract to them, now they can assert uh, their power and, 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 and arrest you. And so that's why he was mad, because it was a gun in the car. He knew it was a gun in the car, but the background says he's a felon, because you know, they still can see all of my surrender ID and driver's license. Even though I surrendered it, I don't no longer have it. He still see it. So he still know, oh, he, this guy's a felon. What the hell? Why is he? But it's like, damn, we don't have jurisdiction. Even if it's a gun in the car, there's nothing we can do because it's outside of our delegated authority to even make an arrest on the individual based upon we have not uh, gained minimum contacts and that's required. Because if, even if you overstep and you found the gun, it would be nothing that you or your overseers could do. And I say overseers because this is like slavery. There's nothing that them or their overseers can do due to the fact that I'm outside of their jurisdiction. And that's what it means when you operate outside of their jurisdiction. That's all. And people say, oh, feds. Look, I'm going to tell you this. The federal government work in every district in the state, right? So say if you live in Illinois. In Illinois, we got something called, no, in Chicago, we got something called the Northern District of Illinois. And that district covers Chicago, uh, cover all Lake County, it covers Will County, and they cover all those districts, right? And so when you're dealing with the federal government, they only deal with federal crimes. It's not literally like a whole separate thing. So you got state crimes, you got federal crimes. Federal crimes would be like a felon in possession of a firearm. It would be like you uh, having all the cocaine or whatever the case might be that can meet the federal the, the federal guidelines, right? But regardless uh, of whether it's a federal crime or state crime, they still have to prove minimum contacts, whether you in federal jurisdiction or state jurisdiction. It really doesn't matter. 
And and so a lot of times when we look at law or what we think would be law, we'll see like, oh, the government will say, oh, this is illegal, that's illegal. Um, any Everybody got the right to exercise their right unlimited, but they have unlimited power and a delegated authority to express their uh, power. Now, the way you can relinquish your, relinquish your rights is through consent or contract. So it, I, I was watching this, um, this um, I don't know, was it a documentary or something? And it was saying that all the people lost their rights due, due to consent. So people consensually give away their rights. People consensually, you know, let these people win. They consensually do it. And they don't even know because uh, they, 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 they confuse. They just arguing the Constitution. So I'm going to let y'all know this, right? So people will say, oh, the Constitution, Constitution, right? Uh, did y'all know y'all step outside of the Constitution once they gain minimum contacts? Y'all know that? Because minimum contacts protect you as the individual, and it protects your rights. Now, you can relinquish those rights that's given to you by the Constitution, your constitutionally protected rights. You can relinquish those and, and, and be subjected to a statutory jurisdiction due to the fact that you gave them minimum contacts. Now... <clears throat> They only can they only can have unlimited delegated authority when they have jurisdiction over something, and they don't have to include the Constitution at all due to the fact that when you enter inside their house in their federal territories, they got the right to make a claim against you. So if you live in any any part of the District of Columbia, they can make a claim. So when I was telling the officer, I live in the United States of America Republic. I live in the United States of America Republic. <clears throat> I live in the United States of America Republic. The reason why he couldn't take that address is because that is not nowhere near in the federal territories. Because people mix up America in the federal territories. <clears throat> 1146 South Apple Street with, the, with that zip code, that's, that's within the federal territories. Not because it's the land, it's the federal territories because it's, it's um, fictitious. It's all fictitious. Any zip codes, uh, all zip codes are aligned with the United States. So the United States and the District of Columbia, that's who owns the zip codes. That's who owns the fictitious addresses. So if you claim to reside in any of the several states and you live within the, and you claim a, a federal territory address, they can make a claim against you and you vow and you, and you waive minimum contacts, and you waive personal jurisdiction. And guess what? You're going to go to jail. And after that, um, you're going to go to court. You're going to get treated like a normal U.S. citizen. And guess what the first thing you're going to tell the judge? Oh, Your Honor, um, you guys are violating my constitutional rights. But you, fail, you fall within minimum contacts. So therefore, we can make a claim against you and subject you to the statutory jurisdiction due to the fact that you waive all your rights and you have complete contract with the state. Therefore, we have jurisdiction over the matter. Even if you sign something that we gave you that was consensual, even if you tell the officer where you live that was consensual, uh, even if you give the police a, a driver's license or if you have a driver's license that was all consensual, how do we do anything to you. We didn't force you to do anything. You did that. You get it? Y'all see how trickery the system is? So when a so when a guy went to court <clears throat> so when a guy went to court and he was arguing with the judge, he was like what give you guys jurisdiction? He said you signed a ticket on the, on the 11th. Now the ticket that he signed was an I-bond. An I-bond was trying to show that he will appear to court. Now, by him signing that in front of the officer, that gives the court jurisdiction because guess what the guess what the judge said well, a lot of people missed out. He said there's nothing in no law that exclusively says anything that we give you has to say jurisdiction. You get what I'm saying? So he said nothing has to be exclusively jurisdiction. Like nothing has to exclusively say jurisdiction for us to get jurisdiction. And that was like, damn. Just something that small, and you got millions of people who secure party creditors telling us to sign those uh, tickets. Telling us to sign, oh, the, the ticket is a check. You sign the check, and you cash yourself in jail. And so a lot of people overlook that. 
and, and I want you guys to check that out. Like, you know, really understand minimum contact. So let me let me go over all the contracts in the state. Let me just explain. Your state ID is a contract and evidence of, of residency. That's number one. Number two, your driver's license is a contract and evidence of residency. Contract number two. Contract number three and probability. It's not 100%, but just canceled out anyway. Voter's registration with the state. Um, your voter's registration is a contract and it's also evidence of residency in the District of Columbia. Number four, registration. Registration is evidence of, I mean, it's contract, is a contract and also evidence of residency. Boom, those are four contracts you have with the state. Now, eliminate those contracts. Now, this is what happened. You have no contracts, right? You're a free man. Let's deal with the fifth contract. The fifth contract is a contractual waiver. A contractual waiver can be done at any moment at any time. Now, this has to be done, of course, by a police officer because uh, going to a store or something like that, no. They have to get a contractual waiver from you. So you have to be the one to confess to them that they have jurisdiction. You feel what I'm saying? So it can happen at any time. So you, I can I can stop. Look, you see how I got out that way? I got out the way last week, right? I can be a slave this week and say, my address is 2111 South uh, Lemonade Street. And I can go to jail. And I can waive my own rights too. Like I said, you got the right to waive your rights at any time. You can waive them at any time. You can get these people contract at any time. So that's when you're done with the contractual waiver because remember, he's seen the ID on the on the file the whole time, but that's not my ID. I surrendered it, and I actually got a signature that I surrendered it. So it's no it's no evidence of residency because especially the old ID that's not evidence of residency. Therefore, and also you you surrendered it, so it's no contract, no evidence of residency, and no contract with the state. So let's see, can we get a contractual waiver? Let's see, can we get him to admit the address? I didn't admit it. Oh, boy. I didn't admit it. Therefore, they didn't have jurisdiction in that aspect. What else? You know? So that's why, you know, it's very important to know this stuff, y'all. It's very important to know this stuff. And trust me, anybody can give a contractual waiver because every, everybody don't know about it. So those are really like the five contracts that you will have with the state. And also, your home will be the last one, right? And so my video on how to deregister your home and everything like that, it will be out soon. As soon as I go up to the Office of Deeds, I haven't went up there yet to get all the proper paperwork to show y'all how to properly do it step by step on how to cancel out um your um your, your registration if you home if you own a home now if you got a mortgage or anything like that that's that has to be argued i'm gonna tell you why now i had many people that actually got in trouble you know they caught a federal case and their name was on the lease so when they went to court to try to prove that they don't have jurisdiction they brought the landlord and the lease to trial and the landlord no they showed the the lease they showed the utility bill with their name on it and everything. So they challenged the jurisdiction, went down the drain. <laughs> they challenged the jurisdiction, went all the way down the drain. And that's why it's very important to understand jurisdiction. If you don't understand it, it's, it's going to be very hard for you to really just take off with it. It's going to be hard because that's the main thing that, that's keeping me everybody down. So it's not they're attacking the nationality. They're not attacking your status or they're not attacking your rights or nothing like that. You just gave up minimum contacts. That's it. So once they so once they gain minimum contacts, what you, what you think they're gonna do? They're not violating your rights. Now they they within their delegated authority. Y'all see the whole time when he stopped me, right? He wanted to pull me out, but he couldn't. He had to follow the rules like everybody else. I had to follow the rules and to protect myself and my rights. He got to follow the rules to try to find a way to manipulate me. He will with he will within his delegated authority to do so. It's just every officer walk around here with the assumption that everybody is slaves. Everybody is slaves to them. Everybody have contract or something. 
There's no way this man is just walking around and we can't arrest him because it's they they like because once they find out they gotta let me go. They who is this guy? Like what what's to him? Like how did he how did he just do this? Like why this stuff says says this on his passport? So you can just imagine the officer who pulled me over. He probably had nightmares. Told his wife like, man, I pulled this guy over. He's like a normal guy. He had no license, no registration, no insurance. She said, oh, my God, did you guys arrest him? We couldn't. They said, why? Oh, my, my overseer, he told me um, that we couldn't arrest him because I guess he got diplomatic immunity. What was it? Like, was he a diplomat? No, he's a regular guy. And he probably doing research. I could just only imagine if he watched some of my videos, searched my Facebook page up or something, he probably like, Man, because I know I'd be curious. I'm like, why I couldn't arrest them? I thought that when people don't have licenses, no registration, no insurance, that's an arrestable offense. Now, it's something like, it's not like you 100 years in prison, but, hmm, hmm. I'd be thinking, what the heck? What, what, why do he have that on his passport? They give this to normal people? Because I know my passport don't say this. So he probably got his own passport, searching his number up. And now he like, he probably even took a picture of my passport and searched something up and was like, why does it say this? Why does it say that? You know, and, and he probably just shook. <laughs> I know, but you know, you might woke somebody up. Now next time, if I ever get stopped by him, which I wouldn't, because I seen them a few times, they seen my same truck a few times and they haven't said anything. So they, they kind of know who I am and we all good now, but for the, for the most part, yeah, I, I just know he kind of shook. I know I would. <laughs> oh, you said what my passport uh, says on it? Y'all can go down to my community tab and you will see exactly, you will see exactly what's on my passport. You will see exactly the information that they put on there. It just say, um, do not stop, do not detain or arrest this individual based solely upon this notice. No law enforcement action should be initiated. That's it. If I said it in the right way, you know, I could have said it a little different, but you know, it, it said just like that. And I actually got the official screenshots when the police actually, you know, search man up. So, you know, man was the first one to show that do not detain. Once everybody seen that, they. The MCO, it's cool. Um, really, the dealers uh, hold on to it. But what you could say, like I say, you could say you're moving out the country. If you say you're moving out the country, they um, they give you an MCO for your vehicle. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Telling you exporting it out the country. Yeah. Once you say you're exporting it out the country, they it's nothing they can say. You know, I got a lot of videos coming out too, y'all. Um, especially about this repossession thing, right? Hey, I'm, I'm gonna tell y'all something, right? Hold on, give me one second. Give me one second, time. So look, hold on, hold on, I'm about to tell y'all right now, hold on. So look, so, <laughs> all right, now look. Remember I told you guys, right, um, I'm gonna tell y'all a, a few things, right? And this, now we finna switch the story a little bit. 
this is really about um, three possession. Now, what people don't know is, right, now the banks start getting more greedy, right? They start getting way more crafty, right? So this is what the banks starting to do, right? So I follow this group called Repo Talk on Facebook, right? Now, this is a group, now this is a page, nothing but uh, repossession agencies and, you know, and stuff like that. So everybody on there is a repossession agent. You just got to get accepted into the group. I want to say it's about 20,000, 30,000 people, probably more than that, right? So I'm watching, you know, them, now, 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 they break down all the sauce, right? They, they show people everything on how they, you know, how they found it, the, 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 uh, the victim. They be like, okay, so um, we have this, we have this vehicle. We trying to, uh, we trying to get the vehicle, right? So what they starting to do is, right? So they, <laughs> and, uh, and listen, you have to be extremely green to actually believe the dumb stuff that they, that they trying to uh, do, right? So they are pretty much called, uh, they'll come to your house, right? They'll come to your house uh, early in the morning, right? And they'll say, hey, the bank needs to do an inspection to see if the vehicle is still some good, right? You know, see if the uh, car is running and everything like that. And so they said, so they lied to the person to say, the bank said they'll give you an extension. They're they not tripping, they just want to see if the car running. So the person will take it out of their garage and let the so quote unquote inspector inspect the vehicle, right? And what the inspector will do, he'll bring an assistant with him, but the assistant will be in another car. And so by the assistant being in another car, in the other car, right? They are pretty much, uh, thank y'all, thank you DA, I'm gonna answer your question soon. They'll pretty much stay in the car and then they'll be like, um, yeah, he just come with, he just coming with me. You know, he just he's just a student of mine. So the guy won't he wouldn't get in the car, but he would just be in a second car. So what they'll do is they'll get in the car, start the car up, and they'll pull off, right? And they'll try to drive around and see if the car, you know, some good or whatever, and they'll just leave the scene just like that. They start getting so crafty, y'all. Like really crafty, like this is crazy. I'm like, I ain't never in my life seeing this type of you know greediness but this is you gotta know how to do it before charge offs because understand this the bank don't go after the repossession after it's charged off i told you guys that already they don't go after it no more after your car is charged off they don't go after no more now this is one of my other students now now this the bad thing right we got the lien release right but remember he cannot be an arm's length away from me so i got the lien le release they sent to me and everything tell me why 15 days before the vehicle was about to be charged off. We was at a, he was at 165 days of no payment. That man went outside the next day. His car was gone. I know he was sick. The Mercedes Benz that I posted, I really got a lien release for it. But before you can record it and all that stuff, they took the vehicle, y'all. Took it. Took it. And, and that's, that's what they told him. So now I'm telling him, I'm like, look, just pay what you owe and start over. They told this man he'd have to pay off the entire vehicle for them to release it. I was like, wow. <sighs> man, this is what we got to go through, y'all. You know, just be careful, y'all. Um, just be careful, you know. The way I was able to have my vehicle for over six months, actually, I'm at a year right now. I ain't never made a payment in a year. But, you know, they charged off my loan. I ain't worried about that no more. But um, I had private plates the whole time. So, you know, when when um, when you drive around with state plates, you got the, um, what's those things called? The tow truck. They got automatic scanners. So they'll scan your plate and they would they would dock it and it would say it's on a repossession list. And that notice would go out because that car is in that area and more repos will be looking for that vehicle and looking for those tags. And they literally, tow trucks ride right through parking spots, parking lot, the scan plates, scan plates all day. And once your stuff stays up for repossession and they, and they uh, partners with that bank, they can just take your car just right there, just like that. Let me ask you a question real quick. Do you know how to properly file a WA? No, I don't deal with those. I don't deal with WABNs. Uh, I never dealt with those, ever. Thank you for the donation, family. What's the difference between driving, importing, and exporting? You still, could, you still could drive a uh, truck? Just be your own independent contractor. You wouldn't even have to deal with the state. You literally can drive, you can literally travel on a passport 
Um, now, this is what you can do. You can get insurance and put your address as rural free delivery, non-domestic, all zeros as, a, as the zip code. And then on top of that, you can uh, use your passport ID. So they ask you where you live at. The, the insurance policy has rural free delivery, non-domestic, uh, all zeros. And your driver's license will be your passport. So when they contact you, they're going to say, who you work for? I work for myself. Then yeah, you can try uh, travel with the private plates. It's all about jurisdiction, y'all. That's all it's about. Gee, I wonder why they took it. Maybe because, no, nah, it's not because it was illegal. You know what I mean? People in this world had their car from repo because they can't pay for it, or they just behind on their payments. Everybody had their car from repos. People just don't know charge off laws. They don't got nothing to do with having your vehicle for repos. I know so many people who hid their car from repos, but they wasn't successful. They hid it for three days and it got taken away. It's really because they don't know nothing about charge-offs. Once you understand charge-offs and you realize that you had your car for 180 days and they was never able to repossess it, it's, it, it's called charge-off without repossession. So that means the bank declared it as a loss on their tax returns um, uh, and they weren't able to recover the, the collateral. Therefore, they won't go after the repossession. Now, the only way they would get the car back is if you're stupid enough to sur voluntarily surrender it. Or the, the other way they can get their money back, if you recontract with them again, which they would state in the letter, if you choose to pay us, you could consider this a contract. So if you consider to make still payments on a car, on a, on a vehicle that's charged off, you have to be the stupidest person in the world. Because understand this, charge-offs can never uh, come back. Once a, a, an account is charged off, that whole entire account is gone. You cannot reinstate a charge off account. That's another thing that they don't tell people because everybody, every banking institution, in order to get that tax credit for that deductible and, that, and, and get that amount back for that loss, they have to file for a, a charge off within uh, 180 days for a secured auto, auto loan. That's why the lender would try their best to try to recover the car before they have to declare it as a loss. So they will they so on the last two months or something, they're gonna search for that car like they're gonna be on the hunt for it. They're gonna be looking for it every day. And once you get to that 180 days, you're gonna get that email. We have successfully charged off your auto loan. So uh if you wanna schedule a payment plan afterwards, you can. So the payment plan, they not in violation of the uh of the tax return because uh, a, a payment plan is you pretty much recontracting on a contract that's already set off. You feel me? So that's how that works when you're dealing with charge-offs. So y'all got to understand the charge-off laws. No, there will be a time and place when the banks will send more than a repo man. They can send, uh, they can send, what I about to say? They can send the lawyers or whatever. Anytime you get a lawsuit or an attempt to lawsuit you in the mail, you just return it back as undelivered. Anytime you send something back as undelivered, they can't successfully uh, serve the notice. No one actually do that. They just see a lawsuit, cut it up and rip it up. No, you just return it back. And so since it's undelivered, they couldn't properly serve the defendant. Therefore, they couldn't gain personal jurisdiction over the matter. That's another lawsuit tactic that anyone can use. Anyone can use that. And also, taking it off your consumer report is the best thing. So you got all these gurus on YouTube. Now, they doing their thing right there. Teach people, hey, we can do that. We can take off the charge-offs. But the bad thing is, you can take off a charge-off, but the person don't have the vehicle. That's the, that's the craziest thing in the world. Because if you charge off my vehicle, I at least want the car still, and you can charge it off. That's a win-win for me, and I can go back and get another car if I wanted to. And I can continue driving with the plates because now I don't have to worry about my car being repossessed because the bank's not going to go out there no more because once it declares a loss, they go back on the books and they take it off the repossession order. It's not. It's, it's no more. Uh, it's not. It, it no longer have. A, it no longer have a repossession order on it. So the repossession order is gone. So they take the order off the vehicle. So people would be scared of. Oh man, they're gonna take my. No, they ain't gonna take your car. I keep my car all the way in the open. I don't even care no more. I've been having my car like that for a long time. At first, I was nervous. I was like, my first six months, I was like, my heart a beat before I leave out the house. I'm like. Did they take it? But because it was the type of uh, car it was, it wasn't like no simple truck. I mean, car, it was a real, real, very expensive, nice car. So I knew that. I'm like, damn, I know they want it. But after it's been charged off, the game over where I won. The only thing about it is the banks might not release the security interest, but that's why I got the process on how to do it. Um, I charged 150 for that process because it's the same process I did with bro, but he just had his car out and about loose and they took it. You know, but he's going to do it again. He told me he's confident he's going to do it again. So, you know, once he gets his next car, he knows what to do with it now.
this time he said he, he getting a $100,000 car. He said he got to get his revenge, you know. No, oh, this is another thing. Somebody said this. Banks will sell your debt. Understand this. This is what from the fuck everybody up. When a bank sell an auto loan debt, the debt that he's referring to is the account number. The account number have a specified debt of the amount that's owed on the account. It has nothing to do with the security interest that's on the vehicle because the security interest on the vehicle would be that same bank. The bank has the power and the discretion to release that security interest. So the person who's the, the collector of that account, who owns the actual account, that's not the person who initiate a repossession. That's only the person who just trying to collect the debt. Now, they don't do a repossession. And also, once you delete it from your credit report, they couldn't collect anymore because now the consumer report is gone. That's how you win again. So anytime you get a charge off on your account, you make sure that that charge off get deleted because if they do sell your sell your debt to a stranger that you ain't do no contract with, so these are random people got having your social security number that you did not contract with, therefore you can file an FTC report and declare identity theft because that is identity theft. Did you know when I bought, when I purchased debt for zombie debt, I purchased a $51,000 auto loan, right? Uh, it was for it was it was for the amount of fifty one thousand, and it was like oh, what type of car it was? It was a Jeep. It was a Jeep uh, Cherokee or something like that, and it had the VIN number. I owned the debt, but I couldn't repossess the vehicle. I just owned the debt, so the debt was fifty one thousand. But the lady information, I had all her, I had her social, her name. I'm like, what the? I created a whole new identity if I wanted to. If I, I'm not that. I don't. That's weird. I don't steal from people or do identity theft but a person can and that that can be classified as F, like as identity theft so say if i wanted to go after her now right even though it's um the statute of limitations is up i bought the debt but let's just say if a person wanted to go after her right now it's, it's so many ways that a person can but that's why you make it your responsibility to file for identity theft because now a stranger have your information i'm a stranger to her she don't know who i am i don't know who she is she did that transaction with Chase Bank, but Chase Bank sold her personal information to a random company who, I don't, I know, I, we haven't done any background checks on these people. We're not even, we're not even uh, sure that these people are legit, you know, companies or anything like that. You could create a, you could create a debt collection company just to steal identity. Do y'all know how dangerous that is? That's theft. That's identity theft. If your debt was sold. To a stranger, that's identity theft. And I'm gonna tell y'all this. And not even to sound racist. Did y'all know most of the people who are collection agencies, who are, it, they sound Middle Eastern or East Indian? I was like, what the? I'm like, this man's calling from a, a plus eight six number or a plus zero one. These people are overseas with your information, with your social security number, with your um, date of birth, with your name, with your ID. They got all of your personal information. That's identity theft. That's why you would contact the bureaus and say, I'm filing identity theft because I do not recognize this account. I recognize the account, but the person who they claim to be the creditor of this account, I don't recognize that person. Therefore, I'm disputing the entire matter under the Fair, uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act. You still got the right. You still got your rights. And that's why people don't understand those little things right there. And, and how they can defend themselves. And you don't gotta worry about no attorney after that because they're not gonna go after a lawsuit because they wouldn't have access no more to your consumer report because they no longer can monitor that account because it's been deleted by the bureaus due to identity theft. And that's, and that's how we've been getting the bureaus. That's how we've been getting everybody. Because they commit fraud, we go right back behind them and we find lodgement into the, into the legal system and, and 15 USC and we win all the time. So anytime you have a car, you know what to do. <laughs> yep. We should learn about consumer laws. Because once you learn about consumer laws, you will be a credit guy. That's why I'm about to report credit. Yep. American capitalist, capitalist way is fraud. Yes. Selling someone identity and you are the original creditor, transferring their identity is considered theft. Identity theft. Because that person have your personal information and you did not disclose that. So therefore, that's a violation of your personal information.
because you don't know the intent of the person who you who you who you didn't try to do it who you didn't try to do business with. You don't know their intent. Anybody can get a, be a collection agency license. Anybody get a debt collector a license. You get a convicted felon who went to prison for identity theft who can get a debt collection uh, license and who can buy debt legally and they can take people's identity. You know that, right? Anybody can get one. Anybody can get a debt collecting license and they can buy debt and they can steal your information and you wouldn't even know. You'll see, why are these inquiries on my credit report? Why are my credit score looking weird? Is someone playing my identity? Yes. You don't think the debt collectors... Like who, who you sell the information to ain't selling your information to other people. Hey man, we got these, we got we got forty thousand files. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and uh, make new identities for these people. Why you think it's identity theft in the United States every two seconds? You think it's just random criminals just doing it every two seconds? Come on now. These debt collection agencies got way more files than than criminals. You got one debt collection agency who probably got way more files than any that, than all the identity hackers in the world. They got over millions and millions and millions and millions of files that's being transferred over. Because remember this, a debt collection agency can sell your debt to another debt collection agency, that, which is smaller than them. And that debt collection agency can sell their debt to another debt collection agency. And that debt collection agency can send it to an independent debt collector. And that independent debt collector can sell it to a guy like me, which they did. And I have all that woman information. You see what I'm saying? So if you don't believe that this system is fraud, you don't know. You don't need to learn the terms and conditions. The terms and conditions is this. Um, you understand charge-offs, you know how to take it off your credit, and after you take it off your credit, you good. You ain't got to worry about that. You don't got to, whether you lock your credit or not, you still got access to their report. I can open up an entire new life with their credit. I could call experience to take the lock off because I got their personal information. You get what I'm saying? You don't, it don't matter if you got the credit lock on your credit. I could call experience and say, hey, there's a lock on my credit file and I'm locked out of my phone. Um, they're going to ask me for all of my information. I got all of your information. They got all of it. And once you get all the information, that's it. They can take all your information. They did it already. I got that woman entire information, everything, and I'm like, wow, these people are scammers. Like, it was an independent person who bad debt who sold the debt to me. That debt is constantly being transferred off, and that person information is being traded. So picture he just sold it to me. I have no good intentions. That's not true. I can have no good intentions, right? I can have no good intentions and mess someone entire life over. And then on top of that, it won't even be just a plan for credit. Using that person's identity, it can open up for other things. It can be government housing, government assistance. It can be, um, it can be open up bank accounts. It can be anything. Really, you don't even have to deal with credit. You can get, you can get government loans from that. You know I can file taxes on behalf of that, that lady and get it sent to my house as a paper check? You ain't knew that? They don't got nothing to do with credit. They got everything to do with a valid tax ID number, which would be your social. And that's why it's very dangerous when you're dealing with these corporations who sell your debt. Once they sell your debt, they got you. They got all your information. So you can put a credit lock on your file, but they can file taxes on your, on your, uh, on your social. They can go buy pistols in your name and your social. They can go and get... Um, government housing and your social without running any credit at all. They can get food stamps under your social. They can get um, anything, life or anything, you know? Because everything don't require credit. Sometimes just having a valid social security don't give them anything. It don't matter, even if her tax debt, she would get the tax debt because remember, it's under that tax ID number. So say for instance, Say if a debt collection agency, right, stole someone's identity. We filed $3 million, right? We said this person made $3 million. We make fake employers. We uh, up uploaded fake W-2s, right? And we filed out of that $300,000 or $3 million or whatever, we filed for $400,000 back in back taxes, right? The IRS, if we filed it correctly, the IRS would give us a return with, the, with, a, with a paper check. If they give us a return in a paper check, Right? 
and say, matter of fact, it wouldn't even be a paper check. What if it was just a wire, like a transfer over to an account that we made under her name, right? If they were to spend that entire account and was to take every penny, that bill, once the IRS audit the account after like say four or five years, that woman will have a tax, a IRS tax lien on her name. Now eventually she will be able to clear it up, you know, after she found out that she really didn't have no parts of it. But you understand what I'm saying? They just took all of her information. They just created an entirely new, uh, entirely new identity and they took all of her money from her. Not all her money, but you know, they, they did an entire scam, you know? So you gotta, be, you gotta be mindful for that. And so therefore that's identity theft. That's stupid. Anytime you go to court, you're a slave. There is no going to court. The goal is you never go to court. You never go to court. If you go inside the courtroom, therefore they have jurisdiction. Okay, you can't go inside the court. The goal is to get out of jurisdiction. I stay in jurisdiction. Oh man. Family, any questions? Any questions before I get off? <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, Ricky Lot number, y'all had to um go to our last video. I might upload it too on this description. What's up, family? What's going on? You can you get a bond, a title, you can create an affidavit, a title, anything you want. Facts. You never go to court and you never give them jurisdiction, especially you don't give you give them your signature. That special appearance never worked. And you want me to tell you why? Because um, most of the time courts will operate off uh, assumptions. And many people done it. Many people done it. And it's one thing that we always overstep. We always overstep in certain ways. We mess up. And then now it, it just costs us everything. It costs us our freedom, it costs us our rights, it costs us everything. But that's why you cancel our contracts with the state, because we always been on the, the presumption a long time ago that if we just know our constitutional rights, that will set us free. But it was really contract, is, is, is how they got us. And once we relinquish those contracts, we should be in a way better position. Yeah. Yeah, family, you know. Yeah, I do consultations and everything. If anyone want to contact me, you contact me at 224-463-1848. Again, 224-463-1848. Yeah, I want y'all to have a good Sunday, y'all. You know, blessing to y'all and y'all families. I'm out. Peace and love.